Hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. This is David Bonson. I'm the Managing Partner and Chief Investment Officer here at the Bonson Group. And uh, for those of you watching on video, you can tell that I am at a different location than normal, not recording in the Newport studio, not in the quarantine at the Newport house, but actually out in my desert house here in beautiful Rancho Mirage, California where I have, I'm guessing, a thousand pages of research to get read here in the next couple of days and uh, have spent a good portion of today, Friday. I just came out very late last night um, watching a seesaw of a market roller coaster here today. And uh, that follows uh, what was yesterday, um, a, a total market swoon. And so I'm going to kind of walk through all the things that happened in the market this week and then try to cover as much of the fun stuff and bigger picture things that I want to cover, which are all things I wrote about at DividendCafe.com this week. Um, and so the reason for the excessive amount of reading I have in front of me, um, the reason why I'd want to do it here at the desert is because this is one of my favorite places to read. The reason why there's so much to read is you had um, a Fed meeting this week. There is uh, all sorts of, of uh, additional data and reports and things going on in the whole COVID world. Uh, more importantly to me, I think there's an awful lot of macroeconomic uh, stuff that I need to get caught up on. And I've added some research boutiques to my kind of toolbox in the last couple of months. I already probably was reading too much and I've added more. And um, I, I am just sort of right now in a kick where I'd prefer to have information overload versus information apathy. And so I need to kind of go through and deal with it. But it translates into this ongoing process of trying to stay fresh, uh, stay abreast of what's going on, uh, on on the monetary policy front, on the public policy front, uh, the fiscal uh, endeavors that may or may not come out of D.C. And speaking of D.C., I believe that we're now facing the election cycle as a more market sensitive event. Um, and of course, there's just an awful lot of economic uncertainty around the, the whole process uh, coming out of COVID. Uh, I will say as far as the 1800 point drop in markets on Thursday, that um, it was really kind of remarkable how little it affected me personally. I generally, on these really big down days, it adds a lot of stress, anxiety. You get a lot more clients that you know call or whatnot. I had none. I had no such communications. And that doesn't mean maybe some clients weren't out there concerned about it or whatnot, but I really do believe that we've worked extremely hard over these last few months to articulate the messages that matter to our clients and even those of you that aren't our clients hopefully have benefited to some degree from the message of, um, of the reality of markets, of the nature of what we're dealing with right now, the skittishness that's bound to be there for a bit. Uh, but also, even apart from the fact that, that clients made this week a bit easier, and keep in mind, by the way, markets are down 1,800 points on Thursday. They were up 2,500 points in the nine days you know, before we got into this. So uh, a lot of, I think, the fact that people weren't overly distressed in the drop this week is because so much of it was just excessive froth that had kind of come back into markets in recent days. So easy come, easy go uh, type of thing. Um, but also, you know, I, I think a lot of the short term day traders got blown out this week. It's a good thing. Uh, more, much more than that, because that's a very small constituency in the marketplace. But what we would call CTAs, commodity trading advisors that trade heavily on momentum signals in the futures markets. I think there was uh, quite a bit of repositioning there and that I can actually establish uh, with data. And, and so that probably enhanced some of the equity volatility. But here's the thing I kind of want to bring you back to. When you look at the, the just awful, awful weeks of March in the, in the peak levels of the COVID hysteria and the uncertainty around where coronavirus and governmental response to it were going to be going, uh, you had completely frozen bond markets, completely frozen mortgage markets, just exploding credit spreads. Um, you know, really, even with a kitchen sink of policy activity from the Fed, you really had broken financial markets. 
didn't last long, but it was severe. And it was every single signal you could make up was indicating risk off. And not just risk off, that's putting it mildly, but panic on. You know, it was a full blown uh, nail anything you can down to the floor and, and all that type of stuff. Well, in the same exact day, the market dropped 1,800 points this week. You saw credit spreads tighten. You saw mortgages uh, get bid up, non-agency mortgages get bid up. Um, the Nikkei last night, I was watching markets as I was driving out here. And uh, in Japan, they ended uh, up four or 500 points higher than their, their low point in the, tra the trading session, their day trading session. It was night for us, obviously. Um, the futures market was up dramatically. You just, you just didn't have anything that felt systemic. And so I think you have some equity market hiccups right now, and I just think we're going to have a lot more of them. And there's no point being stressed about this one when you're going to be going through more. And yet the broader environment right now speaks to there being a lot of pockets of opportunity, a lot of good value, um, for good or for bad, and it's actually a little bit of both, uh, Federal Reserve that is uh, really indicating that people ought to be putting on risk. Um, the, the base level of the floor, if you will, of a stock market multiple, I think, is generationally higher now as a result of the monetary policy we're living in and the, the Fed put that protects risk assets. Uh, it's not an endorsement of any particular policy at any particular time. It's a description of it. It's a statement of fact. Um, this week, the Fed met and essentially um, gave no indication at all that they're remotely worried about any inflationary pressures. They said that they will keep the zero bound till the end of 2022. And then when you looked at everyone's projections of where we'll be in 2022, they still had inflation at 1.7% and unemployment at 5.5%. So what they're basically telling you is they're not even projecting that their numbers are going to be at a place that would allow them to get off the zero bound then because they're tar targeting 2% inflation and they're targeting something much lower than 5.5% unemployment. We were at 35 before COVID started, so you'd assume they'd at least want to get back down to 4%. So, yeah, I think that uh, they're telling the truth that it will be two and a half years till they cut rates, but that doesn't mean they will, excuse me, raise rates, but I think it could very well be much, much longer than that as well. So the Fed didn't really do anything uh, to disrupt markets this week. Um, they didn't give information on yield curve control other than to say that they're meeting about it, thinking about it, and so forth. But they weren't expected to do much more than that. I'm of the opinion that they are um, going forward with some form of yield pegging, likely later in the summer, early fall. Um, there are analysts I respect a lot who think it'll be after the election later in the year. But either way, um, I believe it's going to happen, but I think right now they're debating how far out the yield curve they want to play in. How much do they want to actually peg certain maturities and treasuries, three years, five years, what have you. So you ha I don't want to get in the weeds on this stuff. It does matter, though. It is important, and if you didn't understand what I said, ask me, because I'll explain it better. But I, I want uh, people to understand the central bank is kind of encouraging people to put on risk. Um, oil prices are essentially up 100% in the last four, five, six weeks. If you, if you ever need a, an excuse to pretend you're afraid about inflation, that's a pretty good one. Oil going up 100% in a month, and they didn't even mention it. Never came up. There was no talk about rising energy prices. So I think that their thesis that we are in a period of, that they're afraid of disinflation um, is is honest. I think I think that they're not pretending anything different, and they committed to eighty billion dollars a month of purchases in treasuries, forty billion a month of purchases in mortgage-backed securities. So another year at one hundred and twenty billion a month. Um, you know we're going to be adding a, a trillion, trillion and a half dollars to the Fed's balance sheet, and so that liquidity backdrop is there. And, and I expect that that will continue to at least provide some sort of, of floor level for risk assets. The hard work is obviously going to be the economy getting up and running 
and uh, that's the part we're going to have to continue monitoring. Um, I have a chart at Dividend Cafe this week regarding the unemployment issue where I think that the, the tables have turned a little bit. At first, people were so afraid of the violent number of increase of job losses, and, and the reality is that those jobs are pro a lot of those jobs are coming back. There'll be a high number that creates a downward trajectory in that, in that aspect. But the question then becomes, do we possibly face a different category of job losses, be, not because of COVID, not because of a restaurant or bar or hotel being closed, but something more white collar that maybe in certain positions, because of recessionary conditions, genuine layoffs um, actually lose their jobs for a longer period of time. We don't really know that. That may not show up in the data for a little bit, so it's something that's worth watching. Um, you know, I, I talk a lot in Dividend Cafe this week about what I don't believe was behind the sell-off this week. And what I mean by that is the, the whole talk about a second wave with COVID. Um, of course, I don't have any idea what's going to end up happening with certain outbreaks of coronavirus. Um, I'm, I'm very much of the opinion that uh, the economy is reopening and will continue on that track and needs to continue on that track and that there are lessons that have been learned over the last few months that hopefully will be helpful at protecting human life, protecting a spread of this virus, um, and, and in the meantime, allow some degree of economic life and, and, and activity to take place. Um, but along the way, I certainly understand that some people may end up getting sick. I, my, my hope would be that we would protect the vulnerable, quarantine the vulnerable and exposed in that sense. But um, as far as the talk this week, that there's been some movement in uh, certain uh, parts of Texas, Arizona, Florida. Uh, I, I don't want to be one of those people that sits here just complaining about, about the media. Um, and first of all, if you're listening to this, you probably already know how I feel about the media. So I don't need to beat the dead horse. But also, it's kind of immaterial to why the market side of it, because my, my whole point is, um, the markets are able to see through things and do so quite quickly uh, that they consider to be sensationalistic or not sensationalistic and, and, and price in those realities and, uh, accordingly. Um, there is a significant increase in testing that's taking place. Uh, that increase in testing ha has a lot to do with the increase of some positive cases. There are some places where the positive cases are at a faster pace even than the testing increases, um, but the deaths and hospitalizations remain either declining or flatlined. Um, and also just the whole underlying issue is economically, why would it be that reopening is an ipso facto disaster that therefore will require some kind of bad economic thing um, it, it, if it hasn't been such for so, so many countries in Europe so far and for the vast majority of the United States. It's a difficult argument to say, see, reopening must have been bad because Arizona has some new cases in a particular county and yet ignore where Georgia or Wisconsin or Colorado have had reasonably benign data. You, you know, it's sauce for the goose, it's sauce for the gander. Um, I don't get to use that expression much. I like it when I can kind of just use it on the fly like that. But I guess here's the point I'd make. Uh, I don't know exactly where the health data will go, but I don't believe for a second that's what the market was responding to. If so, it had a funny way of showing it because it didn't show it in credit markets or mortgages or syndicated loans or any other very economically sensitive subjects of capital markets. Um, it, it, it just looked and felt and smelled a lot like an equity froth coming off a little bit. Um, now, you know, uh, I think that the odds of a Democratic sweep in November um, have gone up quite a bit, uh, just in terms of what the polling and the betting odds are indicating. Uh, both those numbers moving in the Democrats' favor on the Senate races as well as in the presidential race. I don't know if markets will be responding to that yet. It is only the early part of June. And so, you know, almost five months is a long, long time. 
I don't think things look good for the Republicans right now, but I also think that there's an eternity that could change that. So I wouldn't put it, I wouldn't take it off the list of market factors this week, but it wouldn't be at the top of the list. So um, anyways, I think that that kind of covers the issues that were behind this week in the markets. Uh, the Fed, um, it, it, there's more at divincafe.com to kind of to, to digest and, and Hopefully some of those comments have been helpful. Um, what are some of the other things we talk about? I do a little historical issue about bull and bear markets at DividendCafe.com this week that I wrote a few days ago. I'm kind of proud of because uh, I think it's so, so much semantics and so much silliness. And, and you know, we talk about, there. I think some of it's just interesting data points that when you talk about the market averaging 10% a year, like the S&P 500, it's fascinating how much it pretty much never does that. I mean, even anything as low as 8%, as high as 12%, two points plus or minus from an average 10 return, it's done it like six times in the last 100 years. The market gets to its average 9 10% from a lot of minus 20 years and a lot of plus 30 years and things like that. And, and I think that having an understanding of where the math comes from to formulate a, a, a compounded annual growth rate uh, is important because there is a very big difference between an investment that averages 8% each year and then therefore you get you know a net average of 8 by getting literally 8 every year or maybe 7 one year and 9 another versus something that averages 8 a year but does so with plus 30s and minus 20s and other things like that. That's pertinent to an equity investor because it speaks to the volatility that they have to be subject to to get that return or their need to diversify their portfolio with other diver uh, volatility reducing instruments where a lot of our use of alternatives comes in and where formerly a lot of use of bonds for us has come in. And when I say formerly, it's really in the present tense as well. We're heavy owners of fixed income, but we have a challenge in front of us to figure out what the risk reward trade-offs are in, in the fixed income world. Because what we can't do is just say, well, we used to have a diversifier in bonds and now we don't. So people are just gonna have to take the full uh, drawdowns of the equity market. Some clients are totally fine with that. Some investors have no problem with that level of volatility. Uh, others maybe could be taught to not have a problem with it, but they first deserve the right to know what it entails. Uh, how frequently various equity drops can and will happen and what that looks like in the end. Um, so anyways, it's an interesting subject. I unpacked a bit of it more at Dividend Cafe. The, um, I guess, I guess the, the final thing I'll leave you with is that right now, when you look at the uncertainty in the marketplace, and then you see a week like this where, look, the equity markets were up 2,500 points in the first part of June. Then they give back 1,800 in a day. And then on Friday, we were up 800 points. We gave all of that back, went negative, but then came back 500. It may very well be uh, tempting to just say, oh, th this market can't go anywhere for a while. I don't disagree at all. I think it's very possible the market won't go anywhere for a while. I also think it could. I also think that when you're compounding uh, your dividends through this period, that you um, have left yourself in a position where you can benefit from this sort of volatility. Straight down lines are very difficult because even if you're benefiting, it has to stay down and it's still psychologically sometimes very horrifying. A kind of flattish, choppy market like this could become very lucrative for accumulators of dividends. And, and I make that as both a mathematical and an economic statement. So I encourage you to think about that. Uh, and if it weren't for the fact that I had covered so many different categories of things with so many charts, where we go with CapEx from here, um, you know, the, an update on US-China relations, all the good things. Uh, otherwise, I would say, you know, don't worry about listening to or watch, uh, reading DividendCafe.com this week. But I do want you to read it, and I do want you to reach out uh, if you're just a podcast listener or video watcher, um, but you have other questions, please do reach out. We want to answer your questions, have that conversation with you, 
And I really hope you will go enjoy your weekend. Uh, yeah, I've already told you I'm going to do a mine, but don't worry, I will be enjoying it. Thank you so much, as always, for listening to and viewing the Dividend Cafe. And we appreciate any reviews and ratings and fun things like that you can offer us to help boost that uh, podcast distribution. Please have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.